Okay, perfect. So maybe a couple of words about myself. So uh, I I study physics. So I, I'm a physicist. So that uh, I will, uh, and uh, today I will talk about uh, deep learning. So I was at the I had the pleasure to be at the Fritz Haber Institute for uh, I think three years, uh, working with Matthias and Luca, and there we worked on uh, on deep learning uh, applied to material science problem problems, and then I moved uh, in uh, April 2019 to to Bayer again to enhance my affiliation. And today I will give an introduction on uh, on deep learning, and I will also present uh, some uh, material science applications. Although the focus on this lecture is really about uh, the, the methodology, but I tried along the way to uh, add some examples on uh, on material science and how these methodologies have been used. Also, since we have uh, we are doing a live lecture, so it's it's nice if we interact. So I will ask. Uh, uh, once in a while, what do you think, if they have uh, ideas, and then I'll ask you so, and I will ask you to type in the chat, so we'll try a bit, uh, to, to do that, it's kind of uh, new for me uh, as well, but let's try to make it uh, as interactive as possible. Another uh, another ad administrative, let's say, uh, logistic question, a uh, logistic uh, point is that, yes, feel free to, to ask questions along the way, especially if there are clarifying questions that you feel they are uh, uh, they, they are useful for others. So uh, that's all. So then, uh, then uh, we can start. And so yes, uh, so we'll talk about uh, deep learning yeah, and introduction to that. We have uh, quite a lot of ground to cover, so we'll see where where, uh, uh, where we arrive today. And I have the pleasure also to give the next lecture. So we will uh, we maybe not cover all the material today, and we'll bring it over to the next lecture. So I will start with a very brief introduction of uh, neural network. Then we'll pass to the specific of uh, the simplest uh, possible neural network. It's a uh, multi-layer perception or a fully connecting neural network. Neural networks. Then part three is going to be about optimization and regularization in deep learning. And I will also talk about uh, like uh, how a machine learning problem is different from an optimization problem. We have a focus also on um, physics, a couple of examples. And then we'll deep dive into a particular type of architecture that's a convolutional neural network. And the idea there, uh, I will derive that with you starting with the multi-layer perception because I want to give you a really a in-depth view of how you can specialize the network according to the, the need, uh, according to, to the data that you are looking at. So uh, that's about the, the introduction. So let's start with the introduction to the neural network. So. Uh, the, I, I have three main references for this class, and I want to share them with you because there's so much material out there on deep learning, and uh, uh, so sometimes it can be daunting. And so I found I put this uh, together for you these references because I found them very very helpful. And in particular, the first reference is what uh, we will follow uh, mostly, uh, and it's uh, it's a free book, online book. Uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's done by uh, some people at uh, AWS, so Amazon Web Services, and uh, Alexander Smola is also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, teaching at Columbia. And then you have uh, uh, lots of materials about deep learning. And you also have uh, interactive uh, deep learning uh, books with code, math, and discussion, so uh, that covers uh, pretty much everything in deep learning. And of course, as you know, you also have the tutorial that's going to be uh, more a material science focus that, that Andrea uh, give or give or we give, and uh, so the second one, uh, the second reference is a deep learning book by uh, it from MIT Press book by some very no well known people in deep learning, and that's also available for free. And then last but not least, there is a course on on deep learning on uh, on MIT. That's a bit of a higher level, so not many formulas and mathematical equations there, but it could be like a very good uh, and gentle introduction, but still has uh, some depth there too. Yes, and uh, then regarding the reviews of machine learning to apply to material science, and then you can find some uh, some works on on deep learning mentioned. So these ones are the the one that are uh, most recent, uh, as far as I'm aware. So it could be something to to look at from you, and uh, and then others uh, other uh, uh, reviews still on uh, on machine learning or material science. So I wanted to put it there mostly for your reference. So now. Uh, what is uh, what is deep learning? And uh, so, so let's start with uh, with a bigger picture. And uh, you you've already saw in this course, uh, but just to give a, a frame. So artificial intelligence, very broad, and that is uh, defined as lots of different definitions. But let's say 
a working definition could be any technique that enables computer to mimic our behavior. And then we go down uh, deeper and we have a machine learning. Uh, so that's the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So that's the machine learning. And there you have a lot of uh, different techniques that, that you saw uh, in, this, uh, in this course. And, and then we have something that is uh, that was also uh, was actually suggested by by Luca, and I think it's a very good idea to include include this representation learning, uh, where uh, there are uh, some algorithms that you try where you try to learn at the same time the representation, so how you represent your data and the predictive model. So that's a subset of machine learning because you don't always do that. For example, if you have a decision tree, you don't try to learn the representation; you try to have a predictive model. Uh, but if we are in the in the representation learning, then we are trying to uh, represent our data. Uh, in uh, And so there are two uh, main ways to do that. So one way is the symbolic regression, and, and I'm sure uh, Luca talked about that. We have just one slide in the next, uh, in the next um, lecture about that, because there's some very interesting development on uh, with AI Simon. And, uh, and but today we'll talk about, and uh, these two lectures, we talk about deep learning. So the idea there is that we extract patterns from data using neural network. And what we do, we learn a representation and at the same time, a predictive model. And the representation is learned automatically from the data. It's not uh, based on mathematical formulas, but it's a numerical representation, if you want. So that's just to, to give you an idea. So new, deep learning this with neural networks. And uh, as you will see uh, later, deep means just that we have more layers, but we'll go into that in a moment. So uh, why we want to do that? Uh, as as you, you are attending this course, so I think you are uh, quite convinced of that, uh, uh, but uh, just to emphasize that hand engineering features is, so if you really need to hand engineer features, it's, it's time consuming, it's brittle, you know, and uh, it's really not scalable. And in particular, if you think about it, it's very hard to specify rules to accomplish uh, tasks that are complex. So uh, what are the rules to say, okay, that's a tree or a house? Or what are the rules, uh, I, I mean, for more complex tasks, like is this uh, transaction fraudulent or not? And even if you can specify those rules for a particular problem, this rule will not be transferable. You change slightly the problem and the rule will, will fail. And, and so uh, the, the, the power of, uh, of what we are aiming to do in machine learning, in particular in deep learning, uh, is, uh, is to, aim the, uh, to aim to learn the underlying features that are relevant for the task. And we want to do that directly from, from the data. And if you imagine that when you have a framework to learn these underlying features, you just change the data and then you're applying the same framework to learn uh, the features. So that, that's, uh, I would say, the power. Uh, but that's just an idea, right? So how do you, uh, and the power of deep learning is really that this idea is realized through a very quite simple mathematical formulation. And in particular, uh, one learns the underlying features to a series of layers. And uh, so neural network really uh, learn this complex representation from the data, applying uh, multiple, uh, multiple affine transformation plus nonlinearity. We'll show that in detail. Uh, so that is uh, a, known, uh, a, a known thing in neural network, and this I took a paper, a quite a famous paper from 2009 already. And here you see on the, let me just uh, get the, the pointer. So on the left side, we have a, a low level feature. So the network in, in uh, lower level, uh, so the first layers learns uh, low level features. And then it turns out that in mid level features, you have uh, uh, more complex features. So you see here the task was to, to, to get, so the category was about faces. So you see that a part of the faces and here you have part of the cars. And then the more you move through the network uh, towards the end, you have a uh, higher level feature. So as the category here faces, you see that the network is learning faces. And then uh, here the category is about cars. So the, the network learn about cars. And uh, so, uh, and that's also uh, that's something that I want to mention in that we did uh, uh, some work with uh, with Luca and and Matthias. That uh, here we also show that the same thing is possible for material science, where we represented a, a crystal as a, as a diffraction image, let's say, like a more superposition of diffraction images, 
And here you, we, we were able to uh, automatically look at uh, what the network is learning. And you see across the layers, from layer one to layer six, you see that the representation of the network gets more complex. So it's, because if you look at this image, to classify these images, you will look at the points, right? Where the points are located with respect to each other. We'll go into the detail later. But what is uh, sufficient to say here is you see that the, the network gets more complex features. So we also show that for a material science problem. So that's a general, that's why uh, deep learning is, uh, is powerful. And uh, so to motivate you, uh, let's let's start with with a short selection of uh, deep learning applications. So now I will uh, I will ask you to inter. Uh, so okay, so this I present. Sorry, I present some short uh, selection, and then I'll ask you what do you think uh, could be done in material science. So uh, some applications are automatic speech recognition. Uh, so you know your uh, Alexa uses deep learning, your Siri uses deep learning. Uh, image recognition is very mature field in deep learning. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, vehicles, uh, also driving cars, uh, natural language processing, where you use text and you analyze text, is uh, it's really uh, it's really booming these days. And you you use that very often in Google Translate. That is done uh, with a long short term memory network that we'll we'll see in the next lecture. And they also said that they, they use uh, uh, NLP, so natural language processing and deep learning to improve Google searches. So it's, it's really uh, something that uh, um, is impacting lots of lives, if you think about it. Uh, and uh, what I think is close to my heart now is uh, the medical images analysis that uh, there are uh, lots of medical applications uh, that are being developed by, by deep learning. So this is just to give you a general overview on, on what uh, deep learning does, a very short selection. Um, so now uh, we have the uh, we go a bit uh, deeper and and build our first multi-layer perception together. Let's have uh, let's say uh, frame our ideas and start with the classification problems. And so uh, let's say a classification problem just to fix the idea is does this email belong to the spam folder or not? That's like a very early uh, yeah uh, machine learning task. Or does it prom belongs to promotion or social? If you have Google, uh, Gmail, you know that that these are these are tasks. Or is it a transaction fraudulent? Is it is that what I'm experiencing? A cyber attack, for example? Or is it this picture in Melanoma no or not? This could be classification problems. Uh, so now uh, I want to uh, to open the uh, to ask you if you have some ideas of uh, of what could be the some examples in uh, uh, yeah, in, in, in material science. So maybe you can paste in the chat and type or uh, just pick up uh, to see what, what are possible uh, examples of application in, in, uh, of, of, mater of uh, deep learning material science. Nice. Thanks, Max. So classifies in material source light in the visible region or not. Great. So that would be, uh, yes, you have a 1D spectra, I guess, I, and uh, yeah, okay. So then it depends what you start from, right? You can start from a, the configuration of the atoms and then try to predict that. That's, that's a very good point. Somebody else is? All right. Oh, cool. Interpret experimental images, for so example, atom probability. Exactly. And that's a very good point. And we'll have an example later on where people uh, detect atoms from STM images uh, using convolutional neural networks. So it's, it's a very good, very good example. Uh, very nice. So if it comes to your attention, just post it there and we'll come back to your examples. And so now let's see here. Yes. So, and then I put uh, some example for you. So uh, one can imagine that you have a chemical composition. You can ask yourself, is this material going to be a metal insulator in its lowest energy configuration? Or what is the most similar crystal prototype to this material that I have? Or where are the atoms in this uh, STM image located? Uh, is, is, uh, is this a spin configuration close to fermenting transition? Yes or no? So, so these are examples of classification problems. So to set the stage, because we are going to do some work uh, here, uh, from an analytical perspective, let's put this, uh, let's have some terminology. And we'll talk about features we denote with X, which are called, which are the independent variables or covariates, as you want. I'll use uh, that, uh, that uh, interchangeably. And since we are in the classification setting, 
uh, but then we go also uh, to, to the regression setting. But in the classification setting, we have labels or we call depend variable or target. I is going to be the you know, the samples, uh, and n is the number of samples. And we also uh, typically have uh, Q classes. I mean, we call uh, the number of classes Q, and then J is the class index. And uh, and here you will have uh, input features. Let's say we have two input features in this case. Uh, then we will have uh, X1 uh, I and X2 I, X1 and X2 R are uh, the features. And you can have uh, multiple features, obviously. The, the correct label is the Y, so it's the ground truth, uh, which means it's given to us. And the uh, Y hat is what we predict. So this is very different, so bear that in mind. So correct label is Y, that's what we want to get, and then Y hat is what we predict, and ideally it's close to Y as possible. And the goal uh, of, uh, of classification in this case, but it could also be a uh, regression in the same formulation, is uh, to predict the conditional probability of each class given the input xi. So this is how you write it. So you give an xi, the, your input feature, and you predict the conditional probability for each class. So how likely is uh, my sample to be to belong to class um, one given that feature that I have in? And, uh, and then it's, uh, so the, the predicted class uh, y hat, you can always uh, get it from this uh, conditional probabilities because you can just get the and the labels that is uh, it has a higher probability to be picked, and that's your uh, classification part. And uh, and as I said, uh, when you have a y hat that is different from y, you make a mistake, and you will see that we will learn from the mistakes and we'll train the model this way. Um, yeah. So these are the terminology, and then uh, let's set the stage with an example. And so let's imagine that you have a crystal structure classification. This is just to set the stage. Uh, we will not solve the problem, but just, just to have something in mind what the classes represent. So let's say three classes, FCC, BCC, and hexagonal, and uh, you have some structure and you want to, to define which is the most similar prototype. Now, the first thing is you need to represent the label. So uh, in particular, BCC, FCC, and HCP. So the most natural way is to represent calling FCC one, BCC two, and hexagonal tree, uh, but that is not uh, not a good idea because you will introduce uh, fictitious. I mean, in general, it's not a good idea because it will introduce fictitious ordering among classes because two is less than one, right? Sorry, two is more than one, and uh, and three is greater than one. So that is there's really no no uh, ideal ordering for that. So then we introduce something called one hot encoding that uh, I'm I'm sure you're familiar with, but just to go through because we need that for a derivation later. So a one not encoding is just a vector that has as many components as we have categories. In this case, three categories, three components, and uh, and we the component corresponding to the particular instance category is set to one, while the rest are zero. So, for example, if you have a label y, in this case, will be a three-dimensional vector, and it's going to be one zero zero, say for BCC, zero one zero for FCC, and zero zero one for HCP. And you see why we do that? Because if we want to predict probabilities, we probably predict the probability for each class. So that's, that's a natural, uh, just a natural uh, way to, to represent that. So then uh, let's say we have uh, four features. And then uh, let's say for, for sake of discussion, X1 is the packing factor, X2 is the coordination number, X3 is the number of atoms for the unit cell, uh, in the unit cell and X4 is the largest unit cell vector. And, uh, and then given these features, you want to predict what's the likelihood of, uh, what's the probability that uh, the, your structure belongs to one of uh, FCC, BCC, is FCC, BCC, or hexagonal. So the goal is, uh, is to predict PY uh, uh, I given X of I. And this is just uh, you know, an example. So, but, uh, but this is, I, I, with an example, introducing you know, the formalism when, uh, and how you do that in, in deep learning, in, in machine learning in general, actually. And so we'll have three class, three conditional probabilities. So what are the model requirements? So we have four, four input features, and we need to return three outputs. And imagine this output is, uh, is the conditional probability of, uh, to belong to each class. So then we start as simple as possible, and we will do it together. So it's a linear, we start with a linear model, actually in a fine transformation. So you have a, um, and that's a linear model. So 
we can uh, have this uh, this whiteboard and uh, and then have it, write it down virtually. So when we have O1 is the uh, is the first output, and then we have the feature x1 times uh, w1 and coefficients w11 plus the second features times the uh, the parameter here, uh, and, and then again the third feature, fourth feature, and then the bias term. I mean a, a, a coefficient in this case b, and we do it since we have uh, three classes. Right, we do it three times, the very same uh, writing. So O2, X1, uh, W21, plus X2, W22, plus X3, W23, plus X4, W24, plus P2. So if you the same thing, you just change the, uh, the, um, the, 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 like the output that you want to have and the weight of your, of your features here. Now, uh, these, uh, these things that are being highlighted in yellow, they are, they are the coefficients that we're going to learn. And uh, in this, in the, in the deep learning jargon, they're called weights. And so these are usually a lot. So now it's four. Uh, we have only one layer here. So you have four features times three outputs. So you have 12 weights. And this one there, B1, B2, B3, are called biases. So you will see that it's just a terminology, and if you if you look at this, you can really um, very easily uh, see that you can uh, pass to a vectorized form. So O equal W X plus P. So it's a uh, in a fine transformation with matrices, and vectorized forms are particularly important because you want to have uh, calculations that are uh, very scalable and very parallel, especially on GPU. So you will have a lot of uh, vectorized form when you do deep learning, and then. Now it comes to how then is related with the neural network, right? So, and and uh, what we will try to to sketch how people usually draw the network. So you have the input features here. So these are x1, x2, x3, and uh, this is the it's called so-called input layer. So the features that you put in, and then you have some output here, or one, or two, or three. You can interpret that as uh, some sorts of probabilities of classification, as we discussed before. That's the output layer. In this case, we don't have yet any hidden layer uh, for the network. We'll add it later. Uh, the fact that every every input, every x, every coefficient, uh, sorry, every every feature is connected with any out uh, any other output, that means that we have a fully connected layer, and that all the weights here are in principle in principle possible. So then, uh, so this is called softmax regression. And, uh, and that's how the, the network looks like. So then we'll introduce the hidden layer uh, in, in a moment. So uh, maybe I'll stop now and I take any questions, if there are any. Are there any questions so far? All right, uh, so I'll take that as a no. So then we can continue. So, but as you might have guessed, linear is not enough because you need to map, uh, you need, you map input to output and uh, just a single affine transformation. But this is true and works only if the inputs are related to the outputs in a linear way, which is rarely the case because uh, you have, that's a very strong assumption about linearity. And if you think about it, linearity even implies mono, monotonicity. So that means if the feature always increase, then the model output always will increase or always decrease, depends on the, on the coefficient and that Think about it, like if you have an example here, uh, if uh, you want to classify is that a door or a window and the input are the pixel values and the output is that a door or a window, uh, then it's very unlikely that the linear model will do. Or in material science, let's say I have a, I have a crystal there and if I move a crystal at one atom by 0 0.02 angstrom and the input on my atomic position is very unlikely that the band gap is going to be uh, linearly changing. So you need more complex model because the inputs are linked to the output in a complex nonlinear way that often are not known like the door uh, or the window. And in, uh, in the sciences can be actually known in advance, but too difficult to calculate. But for example, solving the, you have to solve the Schrodinger equation or you have to solve the Dirac equation. And, uh, and therefore you, you cannot do that as the computation is costly. And then you look at the shortcoming, a uh, shortcut for that. So then the, the idea to, to, do, to, to solve that is to make, to add complexity. And adding complexity, you remember, we just have the input and the output layer. We just add one more layer. 
so the solution is, is, is quite simple. So you add one hidden layer. And uh, so let's say you do like this, and then you have a hidden uh, layer. Uh, so, so that is uh, what we had before. And then we just add one layer here. And uh, you see that now we have the, uh, the input that are X and then this is W1 because it's the first layer down plus B1, that's the biases and we call it H. And uh, these are the hidden layer. And then the hidden layer here is passed to the output here. And then we apply the same transformation here, getting the outputs there. And this is so-called hidden layers and deep learning is like that because you have lots of hidden layers and that's why it's called deep. So now we have two hidden layers and there are, uh, I see this one is when you pass the H there, just to show you that's kind of a chain. Uh, but then if you think about it, you have an affine transformation and you apply an affine transformation on top of an affine transformation, but this is really not helping because in a fine transformation and in a fine function is also in a fine function. So you're not learning, uh, you're not gaining anything, uh, having more layers. So the trick is that it turns out that you uh, to you just can you just need to add a nonlinear activation function uh, that you apply to your hidden layer, in, and in this way you can represent very complex function because if you have a, a linear a affine transformation plus no linear activation function, and then you have that, then again in a fine transformation plus no linear activation function that is really helping you uh, getting a, a complex model that can that can really uh, learn a lot of complex uh, behavior, and these are called activation function, and uh, essentially it's, it's very simple. So that's what we have uh, so far, right? The hidden layer and the output layer, and these are the features. So the the simple thing to do is just applying a transformation here. And this transformation is called sigma, uh, uh, and we call it sigma, and these are called activation functions. And uh, doing so, we can continue adding the, the layers, and now it makes sense because uh, uh, adding more layers will increase the complexity. And so here, you see you have little layer one uh, coming from this equation, and then you pass either layer one to either layer two with, a, with this activation function, and you pass either layer two uh, to the output. And uh, the, 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 what well, then you can think about a, a little bit more. And if you, if you remember that, now look at just the last layer here, you have an output and then you have uh, a, yeah, an affine transformation of the input H2. So you can imagine that this is being a regression or a classification task. If you look just at the last layer, it's taking H2 in input, which means that uh, you see, you start with X, and then in, in an automatic way, you transform this X uh, in order to arrive uh, towards the end of the network for classification or regression, which means that H2 are effectively now your, your, your features that you're making a decision upon in the last layer. So that's why uh, deep learning learn, uh, uh, learns jointly the representation and the predictor. The representation is all these layers here because you see you're transforming the input in a chain and then at the end you make a, you make a decision. I'll show you later what I mean by that. So, so that is what we meant before by representation learning. And so that, that's, uh, that's a quite an important uh, step to, to remember and, uh, and um, that's why I wanted to highlight it to you. Now we have activation functions. So what, what are actually these activation functions? Uh, so uh, there can be uh, the two most popular choices are rectifying linear unit and sigmoid. Actually, by far, rectifying linear unit is, is uh, what people use. And you see it's the most simplest, uh, I mean, probably at least it's a very, very simple um, non-linear function, right? You just get a max between uh, the x and, and zero. And this was uh, and so that was used uh, in practice in, in a lot of applications. And doesn't it's not a problem if that that, that there is a discontinuity here at x equal to zero. It was thought to be a problem, but it turns out in practice it's not. Another one is the sigmoid activation. And uh, here you see that it's, it's still a nonlinear. Obviously, here you shrink between zero and one the output. There are also uh, different choices like leaky relu, exponential relu, parametric relu, and tan h. Uh, so, uh, but I would say, unless you have strong reason to do so, uh, you should always try with the relu first. 
but it really depends on the task, of course. Uh, now, it turns out that, uh, yes, we said, oh, yeah, the, the networks can, can learn lots of things, uh, adding this nonlinearity, right? But like, is there some ground for that? Yes, there is. Uh, so in uh, 1989, uh, people showed that neural networks with one single layer can approximate any smooth function to any desired accuracy, which means that you just need one in the layer, like the network I showed you before, to learn anything you want. But uh, this doesn't say anything about how you, uh, how you can learn that function and uh, how complex it's going to be. How many nodes do you need? Like, do you need the, the, as many nodes as, uh, as the universe, right? So that's going to be not, not so helpful. So actually, uh, and this is what's, uh, what is cited often to say, okay, you can, can learn lots of complex things. But actually, if you think about it, to answer the question of how good neural networks are, and that's a reference, very nice work uh, by, uh, by uh, some people at MIT. Uh, and uh, so that you want to ask your question of expressibility. So which cuts of function a network can express? And that's exactly what we, we saw this, uh, so reference one and two. So we can represent everything with a single layer, but that's not, that's not it, right? There's also efficiency. So how many resources do I need to, to learn that function? And learnability, how? Uh, easy is to learn that network. So these three together, and you need to have all of three to really uh, be successful in, in when you do in, when you do deep learning. Uh, so efficiency. Now we will just give you uh, like in the next slide we talk about it. Learnability is an open problem. So how how we do we know that the network is learning correctly? And uh, so you will see we'll use gradient descent, and it turns out in practice it learns very well. But there's not too much research. Uh, done on how the network actually actually learn. So then uh, regarding the, uh, so, sorry, regarding expressibility, there's this theorem, regarding the efficiency. So why is it, so we go for shallow networks or deep networks? So in a uh, rephrasing, uh, according to these references, so how many neurons we need in a shallow network to maintain the same expressive power as a deep network? So that's, that's the question, right? Because you can have a huge uh, layer that is in between, just have one layer, but then you don't have deep learning, just a huge uh, single layer, or you have uh, a lot of layers that are, uh, that are uh, smaller, but they are one after the other. And it turns out that if you, and they showed it mathematically, that if you have a polynomial degree D that you want to represent, then in a shallow network, so like, like we show, like just one single layer, you need to have D neurons at most. Uh, while if you get a, a deep network, you, you get a logarithm of uh, base two of D and neurons. So you need uh, much, much less in neurons. So that, that's a kind of a, you know, a toy example of uh, why deep, deep learning is, uh, is, is really picking up. It's because you really uh, need to have only few neurons to express the same, uh, the same function. Uh, and you will need much more neurons in a shallow network. And if you think about it a little bit more, that's not so surprising after all, because uh, there are a lot of work in metrics factorization. And, uh, and if you remember uh, what we showed before, that you have uh, this W, uh, this weight vector, then if you have a lot of layers, you essentially factorize uh, your problem in smaller matrices. So if it is possible to represent your problem in a factorized form, which is not always the case, uh, but uh, in, uh, if you can do that, then uh, you get a great advantage. So um, now uh, we want to, to predict probabilities and labels from, from the network. So how do we do that? So, uh, the, so we have outputs, right, as I said. So it's just a, a, a transformation from the in, in the unit. So we have um, these outputs, and we want to, to output a a probability distribution, so a number between zero and one, and we want the number to be normalized. And so what people do, they use a soft function, soft max function, that you see is just uh, the exponent of this output uh, um, feature, sorry, the, this output, uh, and normalized by that. So then you have a, a, a probability that's between zero and one. And it might remind you of the Boltzmann distribution, uh, regarding the, you know, like your physics, so you know that it reminds you. So it's it just, uh, there's not, I mean, as far as I know, there's not too much 
a really deep connection here. It's just a way to, to normalize the, the output. And uh, once you have this, uh, this output, you can just generate the chosen label looking at what's the maximum uh, output on yj. And so what's the, uh, the class that has the largest probability? All right, so uh, any questions so far? All right. Okay, I see there's one question. So let me see. Um, is there an, anything that can be compared to effective temperature in the soft max function? Um, so, so I uh, let me think. Yes, no, that's, that's true. They are not they are not weighted. So there's there shouldn't be any weight in that case. So they are all equally weighted. So there are some 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 uh, some cases when you have a kind of a Boltzmann uh, factor uh, in, um, for example, in natural language generation, there is something like that when you need to to predict the output and then keep that output to generate the next word. So there they have a, a weighting factor. Uh, that is, uh, so they don't use, they use this idea from uh, from the Boltzmann distribution to carry over, but here I, I don't think so, yeah. Thanks for your question, Luca, yeah. Uh, all right, so then let's go forward. So how do we measure the quality of our predictions? And so we have a soft max that give us a vector uh, Y and we interpret as an estimate condition of probability. And uh, now we have n sample, an example. So in each sample is i. So how do we say that uh, that how good are those estimates from the output? We need to compare with the ground truth. And uh, so we need to compare this estimate with the ground truth. And for that, we need to uh, to have a function that measures the quality of our predicted probabilities. Uh, so and this is a central function in, in machine learning, and it's called loss function. So that compares the ground truth. So what you know being true, because they told you, uh, they give you that from, um, I mean, you can have it from DFT calculation, for example, if you want to predict uh, something in machine learning related DFT calculations, or somebody annotated that. And, uh, and so that's the loss function. Uh, we will derive now the, the cross entropy loss here uh, for the, uh, the very popular uh, uh, loss function for classification. And, uh, and then we'll have a break, so, so that, that you know. So now let's say we have a, and I want to derive it with you because it's everywhere, so I wanted to really uh, have uh, some intuition for that. So we have one sample and three classes, and we ask, what's the likelihood that our model guesses the true uh, value yi when given feature xi as input? And so you can just rewrite that, so in, in uh, we have three classes, so we have BCC, FCC, and HCP. So we predict these three probabilities. And now, and also we uh, remember I told you that we have one of the encoding vectors, so we have YI, that's the, uh, our labels, and it's going to be uh, a vector of uh, three components, uh, three classes, it's going to be uh, one for the right, for the, say, if the, um, if the structure is VCC, it's going to be one, zero, zero. If it's the structure is FCC, it's going to be zero, one zero, and if HCP is going to be zero zero one. So that is just terminology. And then let's assume that we have a prediction uh, out that we predict that the probability for for a given sample is uh, is point one that being BCC and point two being FCC and point seven being HCP. But and we know that the correct label is HCP. So it's going to, and that means it's zero, zero, one. So now we ask ourselves, what is the, given this output, what is the likelihood that our model is correct? And you know, right, that this is 0. 0.7, right? Uh, so, but how is that related to our output? Because we want to, uh, to learn our, uh, let's say, yi, the predictions, y hat. So here we have the yi given xi is equal to 0.7. And this is the probability of being HCP. And you can rewrite that as PYI, uh, sorry, PXI, sorry, PYI being BCC given XI, uh, elevated to the zero because the correct label is, uh, uh, so, so because this is the, 
uh, your uh, one hot encoding, so the true label, so this is going to be zero here, times the, uh, the second class of P of Y I equals to a CC given XI elevated to the, to the zero power, again, because uh, this is the output, so this is the label that I give you, then times P Y I equals to HCP given XI to the power of one, because uh, that, that's how, uh, you know, that you know that is 0.7, so you're right only if you, uh, for, for this part. And then you can refactor that as P uh, as the product over J, J being the classes of uh, P, Y, uh, J given XI for all samples to the power of Y, J, where Y, J is the component here, the one uh, hot encoding vector. And uh, this, but this is our prediction. So the Y hat J, so that's the prediction. So we can write it like this. And uh, we have the, uh, the likelihood that our model is correct. And that's what we want to maximize, right? That's what we want to have as the maximum is the product over all classes of our prediction here, y j, y, y hat j elevated to the, uh, to the power of y j. That is the true label. It's going to be zero or, or one according to uh, the, the correct label. That's what we did, so, right? So we have the the expression for for our uh, for our output, and uh, this how how is that related with, with our prediction and and the labels? And now we want to, as I told you, we want to maximize the likelihood. Uh, so according to the maximum likelihood estimation, we want to maximize that. We want to maximize as being correct. And you, and this is equivalent actually to uh, minimize the negative law likelihood because you if you uh, if you uh, maximize the uh, you want to maximize the quantity, you can minimize the, the, ne the negative uh, of it, and then the logarithm is uh, monotonic, so you can apply that. And this is how it looks like, because a product becomes a sum, and then here we know what that is. Uh, we just calculated that, that this product, so this uh, log P of uh, Yi given Xi, and so that means we, we substitute that here, and uh, then you see this is a product becomes a sum because you have a logarithm. So you have a sum over all samples of this quantity. And this quantity is actually a very famous quantity in machine learning and it's called, uh, uh, it's, it's a loss function uh, and it's called cross entropy loss. So it's a loss function that compares how good you are, y hat, with respect to what are the true labels that are y. This is called cross entropy loss. And you see that in, in every time you do a classification task, that's what you're going to see. And that's, that's uh, the, the intuition behind this. So uh, then to, to conclude before the break, so uh, we have the model estimate that tells us how probably classes are given the features. And what we do, uh, we, want to, we will train the model to minimize the, uh, the empirical loss. So that means the loss functions on uh, on the data that we have. So the sum over uh, uh, from i from on over i from i to n, so all the samples on how many mistakes we make. And uh, so the loss function for classification is going to be the, the cross entropy loss that we just derived. And uh, it's, uh, it's, clear, it's clear to see that uh, uh, this, uh, the loss function is, is, uh, is minimum when we correctly predict the actual class and we predict that with certainty. And uh, so that is uh, something to, to keep in mind. And this might not be possible due to label noise because uh, maybe there are some samples that are mislabeled, so we cannot really uh, predict, the, uh, predict the label properly uh, because of the noise. But in your case, uh, in machine learning applied to physics and material science, you can actually, that can actually could be possible uh, to some extent because the uh, most of, often, uh, not always, but often you have a, physical principle generating the data. So you can expect that uh, there is a more regularity than uh, images of cats and dogs. And uh, so that is a, it's called empirical, uh, so that's empirical loss. And it's called empirical because it's about, it's only based on the training data that you have. 
And for classification, as I said, this is the cost function. So classification, you already set. And for regression, you already know uh, that, and it is from from your classes, uh, in undergrad classes, I guess. So when and you have your loss function is a mean square error, for example. So you have a prediction here, and you take the difference between the prediction and and the true value, and you square that. And that's the mean square loss. But also other loss functions that are possible. So being contrastive loss, mean absolute error, or uh, other loss that, that you may come come up with. And this is tells us how the network is going to perform. And then once we come back from from uh, the break, uh, we will have uh, we will have the, uh, the, the how we learn this uh, through through the neural network. So then maybe I would say uh, it's um, there are there is five minutes break, right, Santiago? And uh, but in the meantime, I can take questions in the in that break, and then we'll uh, we'll resume in five minutes. Yes, good question. Uh, so for sure in the in the representation, but yeah. So I would say I would put it in the in the representation, but you can also go to to the loss functions because uh, now you see the loss function that depends on the uh, on the on the output. Right, and you're just uh, looking at how different the outputs are. So these are very simple uh, cross entropy or mean square loss. But uh, in in more complex models, you can also put a let's say a you will have a regularization, and you can regularize uh, what you're going to learn and make it as close as possible to a given prior. Uh, let's say you, you have a prior, and then you say, okay, you know, uh, you new network, you are penalized to go away from the prior. And that it goes in the, in the loss function, and for example, in variation algorithm encoded, that's how it's done. Right? But typically, it's going to go in the in the representation. Cool. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so then I guess uh, if the five minutes are 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 done, I'll put a, an alarm so then uh, I know so that I don't run out of time. Great. So that's the way. All right. So now we are back and. Uh, we are going to see how do we compute the predictions uh, in practice. So uh, we have here the neural network, the, the input, and then we have the weight, as you saw before. And uh, so what we do, we compute this. Uh, so this uh, I showed you before. Uh, how you, we compute the product, the input features times the weight, plus the bias. And then we pass that to the, to the hidden layers, and then if we have more hidden layers, we pass to the next one. If you have only one, you pass it to the output. And once you have there, we have we are going to have a prediction and we compare this output with the ground truth. And we compare and we have a loss function to see uh, how that, that compares. So mathematically, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's again uh, very simple. So as, as I saw before, so you have a Z, usually it's called like that before the activation. So it's W1X. You don't have biases because they can be included trivially in the weights. So that's why there's no plus B here. And then you have uh, H that is just the application of the nonlinear function. And then you have uh, your outputs there. And then you calculate the loss function between the output and, uh, and O and the Y. So you go from input to output. You see on the four, it's called four propagation. So you go from left to right. And uh, so that's how you compute the prediction. Now let's go to see how do we actually uh, learn this, right? Because we have just uh, Ws and we want to, to learn those Ws. So we, uh, what we introduced, right, it was the loss function. Now you have a loss function of y uh, i, that's the true, uh, the ground truth. And then v was called y hat before. Now we call it uh, explicitly a function of a, a input features and the weights. And we want to we want to find argmin of W, which means that we want to find the uh, collection of weights that minimize this loss function, called uh, empirical loss. And uh, this is a nice feature taken from uh, from a NG course, introductory course on machine learning. So that's the landscape. So this would be like J W one J W one W two. So in two dimensions, you should have W one and W two. And what we want to do, let's say we are in a we pick, need to pick random points W because we have no idea when we start, right? Uh, where we start, unless we put some prior knowledge as, as Max was saying before. But let's assume we really, most often uh, people start from, from random weights from, from the network. And, uh, and what we would like to do is to minimize that, uh, that JW. 
here. And uh, we want to have the past. This is the lowest part uh, of the of the energy landscape. So we want to have something something like that. So how to do that? Uh, uh, what people do, uh, they, 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 why the, the technique that is most widely used is called gradient descent. And now we derive why we, we do a gradient descent. So, so let's do it in 1D. So we have a function that uh, it, it goes from R to R, and this function is continuous and differentiable. Have in mind that this function is our empirical loss, uh, J, JW. So, we can always expand this function into in Taylor expansion of, uh, of our function. And then you know from your classes in physics, of course, that is a Taylor expansion at uh, first order here, plus epsilon square, epsilon in, in your mind, it should be small. And uh, so this is a, a first order approximation of our, of our uh, function. Now, if you have a small epsilon, uh, we know that if we move in the direction of the negative gradient, F will decrease. That we know. Uh, and that this is the, the working assumption of, of uh, gradient descent. Uh, this is the property of the gradient, of course. So now you have the, uh, your, uh, your Taylor expansion, and then you, you define a step size eta greater than zero. And now we say, okay, now we have a step. Uh, so we have epsilon that we define as uh, a minus the our step size eta times f prime times the derivative because we said if we want to to have a function uh, that uh, if we want to make the function decrease we need, we need to make a step in the negative uh, direction of the gradient and now we show that we actually make progress doing that in the first uh, that approximation so now what we do we just simply get this epsilon here that we define like this and that's uh, the the core of gradient descent and we put it in, in, the, in this uh, function here. And then you have f of x minus eta f prime of x is equal to f of x minus eta f prime square of x, right? Because you have f prime here and f prime there, so it's a square, plus higher order terms in our step size. And now look at this uh, component here, this part is eta f prime uh, square. That's greater or equal than zero because uh, the step size is positive and it's a square. And therefore, there's a minus sign that means that it's negative. So this is less than zero. So now let's compare these two parts. So we have a function of the left that is, uh, uh, sorry, if we have f prime here, so that's different than zero, that means we are making progress because the left side is smaller than the right side. And remember, we want to go down here. We want to go down to this, uh, uh, down here to the path we showed before. So now uh, rewriting that, so if eta is much less than one, then we are left with, with the, only this, and this is less than zero. That means that we, we may, if we use x and we assign x to x minus eta is prime of x, that means that we minimize our function. And that's, uh, that's the that's how gradient descent works. So you just need to iterate x and making this uh, um, this change to the x, and then the value of f of x will decline in the first order. So now uh, eta is a very crucial uh, part, and if you train any uh, any machine learning uh, sorry any deep learning model, learning rate is the day one parameter you should look at in in the optimization. And this is called learning rate. So now here we have a uh, we have a recap. So a loss function in this case f is our j of w, and the gradient descent algorithm you initialize w randomly. There are different possible strategies, but let's say it's random, and and then uh, uh, you uh, you have a loop until convergence. You compute the gradient, and then you update the weight. That's our x from before. So it's, it's w. So we say w minus eta, the learning rate and the derivative of, uh, of this uh, loss uh, function, and then we, uh, we return the weights. And from what we saw before, that should go down in the, in the, if eta is small enough. Any questions so far? Yes, so Luca is asking, gradient descent is on the simplest multidimensional optimization of arbitrary small functions. Is there any good reason why deep learning community is not using more powerful methods known to the quantum chemistry community like, uh, 
uh, BFGS. I suppose it has to do with scalability, but also material size optimization can have a lot of degrees of freedom. I'm just wondering. Yes, uh, very good point, Luca. So uh, people in the machine learning community are using uh, gradient descent because the models are huge and uh, um, it will cost a lot of computational power to use this, uh, uh, these methods that, that you are referring to. Uh, so, so that is uh, the why uh, people stick with gradient descent and there are better alternatives for sure. And you say BFGS, for example, where you have a kind of second order information and people started to do that. Actually, uh, in, the, in the Ferminet paper, that we're going to present uh, later, uh, they use a second order uh, method. So it, people uh, can do that. And actually, it's a very good point. So you don't have to stick with, uh, with the gradient descent algorithm, uh, especially since you have uh, uh, typically a smaller problem. So it might be really worthwhile uh, exploring, uh, exploring this possibility of higher order methods. And also another thing that, uh, yeah, uh, so, so that is uh, yeah, what I wanted to say. Yeah, good. Uh, as usual, just, just type if you have questions. Uh, so, because if you have one question, hopefully other people have one at the same. Uh, all right, cool. So let's take another question. It seems that deep learning is a problem of vanishing gradient problem, but it's not clear to me where it comes from. Very good point. So uh, it will come clear. Yes. Uh, so two things. So we will uh, do the uh, the vanishing gradient problem is often in in uh, LSTM in recurrent neural networks, and that's topic for class two. And we will we will show that. Uh, yeah. So so that is. Uh, but essentially, it's that you have. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you have a chain rules, and you have lots of layers, and you multiply the gradients across layers. And uh, that's what we'll show like in, a, in the back propagation. Uh, so, so that is the division gradient problem, but really the derivation is going to be in the second class. Cool, thanks, Max. So uh, we need to the, the get the, uh, the gradient, uh, dj of w, and that's very difficult to calculate because you have a million parameter, you need to calculate the gradient based, uh, uh, for a million parameter. And how it's done? It's done via back propagation. And now we're going to derive like uh, is like uh, this uh, how back propagation is is working. So, so how do we compute uh, gradients with back propagation? So uh, we we need to compute dj of w, and uh, so back propagation just is the method of how to compute djw. And the main idea is that to you is to use the chain rule. You know from the rule of the chain rule of calculus, if you have a function y, sorry, if you have y that is a function of x and z of a function of, uh, uh, sorry, z of a function of y, we can compute the derivative of z with respect to x uh, via the product. So dz dx is a product of dz dy dy dx and then you have, uh, so that's, that's the chain part. And here is the product. So for, ve for vector asymptotic matrix multiplication, if you have an element-wise uh, operation, you will have an element-wise product. But that imagine is just a simply uh, matrix multiplication. And uh, so now we will uh, we will derive that. So uh, so we want to compute the gradients with back propagation. So we have our our uh, neural networks as we had before. And uh, yes, so we have a loss function, ground truth. And uh, so what we need to calculate is we need to calculate the derivative of JW for all layers. Because you see W1 is here and W2 is there. So we need to go across the layers because the Ws are a different part of the, of the network. So then what, this is what we will calculate. So uh, we know the, the four propagation path as, as I showed you before, so W, uh, Z is W1X, and then you take the, that to the, the activation function, and then the output layer here. And then you have a loss function. Now uh, we want to, to get the derivative of J with respect to W2, which are the, the parameters on the, on, uh, of this layer. And uh, you see that uh, W so it depends on O, so you need to take the derivative of, uh, of uh, of, uh, w, of j with respect to w2 is a product of dj do and do dw2. And then you can calculate do uh, dw2 here. And if you look at this expression, 
is simply H transpose. You need to transpose because it's, uh, there are matrices, and so you need to take care of the rule of, uh, of differentiation. And that's, that's DJ DW2. So you have a derivative of J respect to O times uh, the, uh, the H transpose, which are your hidden uh, layer. Remember, DJ DO is a simple function to calculate. J is, uh, like you said before, uh, so before the cross entropy law. So it's a very easy function to calculate. So this is uh, DJ uh, DW2. So that's a very easy one because it's closer to the output, right? If you think about it. Now we need to calculate the DJ DW1. So to compute that, we need to walk backwards in the network. And that's why it's called back propagation. So now we are here. And now we need to go backwards and we need to calculate the, the derivative of, uh, of J uh, with respect to H here. And, and then it's because you need to arrive at the end, we need to arrive at W1. So we need to go walk our way backwards. So, and this is the product of D, DJ, DO, DO, uh, DH. And then you can calculate DO, DH from here is simply DW2 uh, transpose. So they have DW2 transpose by DJ, um, and the JDO. All right. So now we need to uh, to continue going backwards because we want remember we want to derivative of DJ DW one. So we have DJ uh, DZ now because uh, we are here, and we have a product between DJ uh, DJ DH and DH DZ. And now we take the derivative of the HDZ, and that's simply the, uh, the derivative of the activation function. And remember, the activation function is, is the element wise. And so uh, that means you, the product in this case will be element wise. It's not very important for the purpose of this discussion, but that's why you have element wise here multiplication. So now we have a DJ uh, DH uh, times uh, sigma prime Z. And so we are here. Now we have one more step to do. Uh, to get the derivative of uh, of j uh, with respect to w1. And uh, so that is the derivative of j with respect to that times the derivative of that uh, with respect to uh, w, uh, w1. And uh, that you can see from this expression, that is simply x transpose. And then we get the final expression from uh, dj uh, dw1, what we're after. So how we should change the weight in order to minimize our loss function. So that, that is what is telling you. And it's dj dz x transpose. But now we know dj dz, and that's the expression. And then it's uh, here dj dh, and then you go back again. And then we have our dj do, which is a simple function to calculate. So if you, th if you think about it, we work our way backward to calculate how the, the, uh, we should change the, the weight in order to make the loss function smaller. So in a recap, we have a loss function here, and we go backwards, uh, calculating the derivative. And since the W2 is, is there, so it's an easy one to do. Uh, so, so we have uh, uh, here, we calculated that. And this is going to be the derivative that you need in the gradient descent that we showed before. And then to get the, the uh, it's a DJW1, we need to do some extra work passing through the, through the hidden layers, which we just did. And then uh, we will uh, we arrive at DJ and, and DW1. And these are, uh, we, we derive uh, this, and this is uh, how we, we have done two so called back propagation. So uh, now, how is that done in practice? Because you have uh, millions of, uh, of uh, parameters, and uh, uh, you know, it's going to be every time you have a new model, you need to calculate that analytically, right? This DJ, DW. And it can be very complicated, uh, especially if you have a complex architecture. So what what is uh, what people use, and it's, it's a great uh, relief actually, is that there's something called automatic differentiation. So you can automatically uh, evaluate the derivative of a specific function here without actually writing the, the explicit formula for it. And uh, this is uh, this is uh, done in, uh, in standard packages. And so the idea is that you just get uh, your, your derivative and you split that in elementary functions. And for example, uh, in the very same way we applied the chain rule before, you can just uh, split uh, operations in, in sequence of uh, primitive operations. So here, for example, if you have, uh, let's say, 
uh, Z, uh, you have uh, WX plus P, you can say, okay, I have an intermediate T1, and this is WX, and then I pass it that to the next part, and I pass it that to the next part. And the trick is that for each, for each of those parts, you know how to calculate, how to apply the chain rule. Uh, and therefore, you will, have, uh, you will have an expression calculating in an automatic fashion. And then I come to the question. I saw a question, I'll come back in a moment. So auto differentiation is, is uh, better for derivatives than symbolic differentiation because symbolic differentiation can lead to inefficient code. And it's also better for num of numerical differentiation because you, have, uh, you don't introduce errors due to the discretization and it's also uh, much faster. And all uh, deep learning frameworks, PyTorch and TensorFlow, uh, MXNet, uh, they always use auto differentiation. So that's the package that they use. And it's just implementing this, uh, this idea of uh, getting the chain rule and, and getting um, a sequence of primitive operations. So I saw a question. So I guess uh, that's the question. Um, ah, no. OK, so that's from before. All right. Uh, so this is uh, what. Uh, what pet propagation is and how we train uh, the, the neural networks. So uh, then maybe let's, let's uh, so here you see gradient descent and then we compute the gradient and we need the gradient, right? To, to go to the gradient descent and that's how we, we do it like I showed you uh, before. Any questions uh, regarding this before we move forward? All right. Um, okay, I'll continue. If they come, just write it in the chat and then I come to the questions. So now we have the gradient calculated to back propagation. Now we have this learning rate, remember, uh, that uh, it was related to the, uh, to the step that we take in the, in the, in the Taylor series expansion of first order. And you can imagine that that is crucial uh, to, uh, to get a, a well-performing uh, gradient descent algorithm. And uh, actually, uh, it's, uh, it really is also in practice uh, very important. If eta is too small, you can see that uh, the, the model will get stuck and will not go to the, to the optimal region. Here is only 1D, but you need to imagine high dimensional space. If you just move too slowly, you might get stuck in plateaus and you don't move enough. Or uh, if you have uh, it and it is too large, you overshoot and you just move from one side to another of, the, of the, your space and then you're not able to converge. So uh, you need to get the eta that is just right, that it goes move to the right solution. And uh, here there are some, uh, some methods that will not go into detail. I just give you the, the, the list that are what are the state of the art. Uh, and here is actually uh, what Lucas mentioned before. It's quite important because then uh, here you really need to pick the learning rate. You're not using the curvature of the space. That will give you a lot of information, right? And what the VFTS does. So in uh, the second order motor will, will give you that. And then you can uh, uh, be, um, yeah, no, uh, so let's say go better and have a more informed decision to go to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the minimum. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me uh, just uh, finish this slide and then I come to your question, Max. So uh, how do we set the right learning rate? Well, uh, it is difficult or impossible to find a good learning rate for the optimization. So what people have done is to have adaptive learning rate, looking at uh, how, what's happening in the optimization and then adapting the learning rate as you go. Uh, yes, uh, then we go into the adaptive learning rate, but then I'll take the question from Max. So uh, uh, Max is asking, I guess we need to store the gradients for each layer during backprop. So uh, could this lead to a memory issue, to memory consuming for many layers? Yes, uh, you're right. We need to, we need to store that, uh, these gradients. Actually, uh, you need to store, um, uh, yes, uh, you will have uh, forward propagation and, and back propagation that, that, uh, that they share, um, quantities that need to be computed. So this memory will be computed only once, but they need to be stored. And then for sure that that could cause uh, memory issues, uh, especially if you are on uh, on GPUs. On the good side is that uh, this uh, uh, it's a very, um, yeah, it's very optimized. There are a lot of uh, codes that have been optimized for that. So, so that is uh, something that has been, uh, yeah, uh, is, is very well done in the, in the community. Yeah, uh, so, so that is um, this also, uh, yes, one other thing that I should mention is that uh, now we come to that. You, uh, in practice, you don't compute the gradient with all the training samples, but you just take a small subset of those and then start moving towards the, towards the minimum. So that also helps. Yeah, 
cool. Uh, so then we can continue. So adapting learning rate. So how do you adapt the learning rate? So this is just um, uh, qualitative. So you look how large the gradient is, how stable is with respect to operation. That's this uh, momentum, for example, or how fast the learning is happening, how big the weights are, and then you can regularize that or clip the gradients and approximately second order information, which is uh, rarely done in practice uh, until now. But I think it could be a very good venue for material science because you have few data points. So that could be a really good venue uh, to explore. And the most commonly adaptive algorithm are called Adam, Ada Delta, Ada Grab, and RSMS Pop. No, not very important uh, how they are done, uh, but uh, so that you know uh, which ones are, are people use. Now, uh, as I was saying before, uh, if you have DJDW, it's very expensive because you need to calculate over all samples every time, and the process will be very, very slow. Uh, therefore, uh, people, what people do, they take a mini batch. So they, you get the data, you split in, in uh, small batches, uh, and then you calculate the gradient on that. That obviously is a, is a approximation of the two gradient, uh, and uh, my, it's an okay one. Uh, and but it you move much faster to, towards the goal. So instead of uh, uh, you know you have a hundred million, uh, no, 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 like a million parameter, uh, sorry, a million uh, data samples, and if you take just a hundred, you just get a, a very a very quick uh, movement toward, towards your goal optimization. And this turns out uh, to be very very uh, good in practice. Also because there are other uh, things that you can show that the, the returns are less than linear. So the the, the the bigger the, the mini batch gradient descent, it's not that you gain much more having more samples. Uh, so, but typically you have uh, 32, 64, 128 samples, depending on what's your GPU that you have. And if M is equal to one, so one sample that's called stochastic gradient descent. And so our mini batch gradient descent algorithm looks like that. So you have the W randomly and until convergence, you pick mini batch of M data points, you compute the gradient and you update the weights. And then you continue uh, doing like this. And it's going to be noisy, right? Because you have only the estimate of the gradient in that regard. And uh, one thing also that I should mention is that if you have a few samples, it really makes sense to do the true gradient descent because otherwise you really add lots of noise in your, uh, in your calculation. And uh, so, so it's, uh, it's actually recommended if you have a few samples to use the gradient descent itself and not the, the stochastic version of that. Or, or the mini batch version of that. Uh, yep. Uh, so now, uh, yes. As, as usual, if you have questions, just uh, just post them in the chat, and I get to them. So uh, now the question is: Is that so far it looks like it's an optimization problem, right? We have a loss function, and then we have a J of W, and then we want to minimize. That, right, so it's arg mean of w with respect to this loss function j w, but isn't it like an optimization problem? And uh, why you need all sorts of regularization and then strange stuff that in machine learning people are doing? If it is truly an optimization problem, also in, in optimization problems are solved all the time in physics, right? You have a ground state wave function of a quantum system. Uh, you have uh, you know your Schrodinger equation for the electrons here. And then you find the, the ground state uh, minimizing uh, the, uh, the energy of the system. This is an optimization problem. The ground state uh, density in function, in functional tier, that's also a, uh, an optimization problem. It looks very similar to what we have here, right? Uh, so it's, it's the same, uh, looks the same at least. And, uh, and there we didn't know about anything. Uh, we, people don't use regularization. They don't need that. They don't need any new techniques. And the key is that uh, there's a difference between optimization and machine learning problem. And uh, the, uh, if you think about it, the argument of uh, on, on JW over W is in machine learning is not a pure traditional optimization problem. And it's because you, um, you don't, in, uh, in machine learning, you care about some performance measure A that is respect with a test set that you don't know you don't have, you only have a training set. And more often, uh, as often, you don't even need the, you know the performance measure, nor you can solve it directly. So you optimize that only indirectly, reducing the cost of, uh, of a JW, the loss function on the training data. And we hope that you will, uh, this doing so, you will improve A. 
That is not uh, like a pure optimization. When J is the goal, is the optimization of J is the goal and the goal in itself, like uh, the, the Schrodinger equation, or uh, like so before, or in, in density functional theory. So that, that, uh, that's a crucial uh, fundamental distinction. And typically the cost function then, uh, it's, um, here uh, it's, it's written as the average of the training set. And this is the P hat data, like the, the, the distribution that we have and we observe. And that's why it's called empirical distribution because you only observe through the training set. And optimized uh, that like an optimization problem is wrong because it will lead to overfitting. So that you always need to keep in mind that you want to do well on unseen data. So actually what, uh, what you want to minimize in, in is the expectation taken on the true underlying data generating distribution, imagine as representing by the test set that you don't have. And uh, so then it's, uh, this will be see this P data, the true uh, uh, underlying distribution. And if we don't know P data, or it's too costly to compute, then, uh, and you have only training samples, then we have a machine learning problem. If we know exactly the equation that generated these samples, then we don't have a machine learning problem, we have an optimization problem. And, uh, and then you show the Schrodinger equation or you show the density functional theory. And uh, so if we don't have uh, this, uh, uh, this P data, but we have only P hat data, which are only a training sample, then what we have to do, the, the closest thing to do is we minimize the empirical loss on the training data uh, in, oh, sorry, oops, instead of uh, minimizing one. And therefore, that's why we need to take care of the, that our algorithm generalizes well, because we are not using actually uh, the, the, the data that we are not seeing. And uh, so this is also couples to, uh, to what you for sure heard in, in the class that is uh, before that you have underfitting and overseating situation, because again, you are uh, uh, getting this JW an empirical distribution and you, but you want to do well on another set. And uh, so then you have, uh, let's say, this is the data that you have, and we have uh, three, uh, three setups. So here you have uh, the data, and then you have a model, and you see here the model is aligned, so it's uh, really not very complex, and you lose these features of the data. So that's uh, while here you can have a fit that fits well, and uh, it goes, doesn't pick up the noise of the data here, because here you just fit in the noise, and then this will not generalize well. You can get a very good uh, arg mean of j uh, of jw with respect to w, as we said before, on the training, but then on the test, you will really fail to generalize. And these are the scenarios that is the uh, underfitting scenario. So the model doesn't have enough capacity to learn the data. Uh, we have the overfitting scenario where you have too complex and it will not generalize well. And this is also coupled with the question before, like do, how many data do we need, right? Um, so uh, it, the less data you have, uh, and the, the and if you have very few data points, and the model is very complex, it's very easy to overfit. And then you want to be in this scenario, which is the ideal uh, fit. And to do that, you need techniques to avoid to be in the overfitting scenario, because that's where you're going to be in deep learning, because they're complex models, so you will not be in the underfitting scenario ever, nearly ever. And uh, uh, so you want to make sure that you pull away from overfitting and, uh, and go towards the ideal fit. Uh, so uh, then the central challenge in machine learning in this game is that we want to do an unseen output. And here you can see that you have a loss function here as a function of model complexity. And if you have a training loss, you can always go down as possible here. Like you can always go down and you're going to the overfitting regime, but then the generalization loss will go up because it's a different problem that they're trying to solve. While if you are an optimization problem, the training loss is actually the loss that you want to minimize. You don't, you don't have a generalization loss. And uh, you see that the big problem here uh, in deep learning is overfitting. And to, uh, to do that, to, to uh, avoid overfitting, one can have, uh, there are collection of strategies to reduce model capacity in a thoughtful way. And this is called uh, regularization. And then maybe I'll, uh, okay, so I'll, uh, I'll uh, are there any questions until now? So uh, regularization, what is regularization? So it's 
any modification, this is taken from this book by, uh, by Benjo, Gutal and Cooper. So any modification we make to the learning algorithm that is intending to reduce its generalization error, but not its training error, because we are after generalization error. And uh, uh, possible strategies that are quite a bit, there are constraints and penalties. Uh, so to express the generic preference for simple models, and then uh, one or two penalization, we already saw that. Uh, another way is to have multiple hypotheses that explain the training data and are combined in ensemble methods and will show dropout, which is particularly useful in, uh, in neural networks. And then you can also stop the optimization early according to some metrics on a validation set. And then you can, uh, and this is uh, what's my favorite, is to encode specific kind of prior uh, knowledge, so specific, uh, specific kind of architecture in the model. And that uh, will help you in uh, in generalize that. And in the so then I guess uh, since we need to uh, so we will touch upon this in the next lecture. So we'll focus in this on these three uh, because they are really important and specific, uh, mostly specific for for a neural network. So I, I would say uh, that uh, I don't will not start dropout now because there are only a couple of minutes to, to go. Uh, so I will say for, for today, let me just uh, give some uh, closing remarks. So uh, we started having a model, uh, so having some tasks in mind, what is deep learning useful, what it is. And then we went through and wrote like a very simple neural network in linear, uh, just a soft mass regression. And then we applied in, a, in, in a units. And then from there we said, okay, now we need a loss function to, to characterize how well we are doing. And then we derive the cross entropy loss for classification. And you already know the, the, the loss function from regression. And then from there, we said, okay, we have this JW and we need to minimize that. And it's very complicated. How do we do that? Because we need to, uh, to get the, the derivative of J respect to the parameter W. And there uh, we said, okay, you can take derivatives through the chain rules. And that is what that propagation does. And once you have these derivatives, then you can apply gradient descent. That's what people do in deep learning, but you can also have higher order methods in principle to get down this, uh, this uh, JW, so this, uh, this loss. And then we said, okay, this J loss is just the proxy for what we actually want to minimize because we only have training samples. So if we minimize the JW on respect to the training samples, uh, that's not the end of the story. So we need to be mindful that we want our model to generalize well. And to generalize well, since it's not an optimization problem, but it is a machine learning problem, then we need the techniques to do that. And this is uh, regularization here. And that is uh, the topic for, for next class. And yeah, so that, that's, uh, then I guess that, that's all from today. I'd be happy to, uh, to, to answer any questions that, that you might have or comments. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question uh, from, um, why not encoding while the using neural network, but it does not describe uh, the relation of the data and generates, it, and generates high dimensional input data or output data, which used to have specific physical meanings like materials, atom, or, sorry, uh, let me just read it and then I can summarize it. Okay, yes, uh, so the question is, um, you show that uh, that is uh, one-hot encoding to, to represent uh, the, let's say, a variable, but in physics, we have high dimensional input data or output data, and then he's asking, and uh, Shu, Shu is asking, uh, do you think it's sufficient? So, so it means we need to, 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 to uh, so the, the one-hot, for sure, uh, so for the input data, for sure not. Uh, so you really want to put the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 you know, to, to have some input that is physically grounded. But remember here, what I added, uh, what I introduced, this was for the labels in a classification setting. So uh, that is, uh, if you need, if you have a classification task, uh, that, uh, that uh, is, um, it's, uh, it's meaningful because you're not looking at uh, uh, the, 
representing the input, representing the input, that's not, that's all the representation learning. Luca talked about it, and you need to really include uh, the main knowledge. But for the, for the labels itself, then it is a good representation if you're talking about uh, classification. So, okay. Cool. Uh, from Tim, so is there a way to estimate the required number of training samples from number of parameters, dimensionality of the input, etc. So, <clears throat> I, to to my knowledge, there's uh, I don't I don't know uh, regarding this. I don't think there is a way in neural networks. I know there are some uh, um, for, for other methods like uh, kind of ridge regression or you have some uh, some sort of theoretical guarantees. So, uh, so in practice, I'm not aware of uh, of any of those uh, of any required number of uh, training samples. Um, yeah. So, so also because it really depends on uh, the regularization part as well, and because there you, you it's related with the model capacity, and then you can regularize your model. So it's uh, yeah, yeah. So I, the, I, I'm not aware of any in, in the deep learning. Setting apart some rule of thumbs, but uh, but no uh, derivations. Okay. Yeah. So we have a question from uh, from Max. In some machine learning models, it is a common requirement to standardize the method before training. It is also is this also the case in neural networks? Is there any specific pre-processing required for neural networks? So thanks, uh, Max, for the question. So, um, in uh, so some uh, as uh, Max is saying, so you have to say you have features that are on a very different scale. Let's say you have a uh, I don't know the um, let's say the mobility of of your material or uh, like the distance that it hangs from, and then you know very widely range. So it's, it's uh, in your net it's a good idea to scale the to standardize the, these features beforehand, uh, mostly because uh, in the, they will make the the gradient the gradient uh, more stable because then it will uh, it will make the space uh, much uh, more uniform across the dimensions and imagine you have to do the gradient descent in and you have a lot of dimensions so people people do that and it's, it's a good thing to uh, to scale also in case of uh, neural networks and uh, regarding pre-processing i mean in, in material so it depends on the task at hand and it also depends on the on the type of uh, of neural networks that that you want to do and you want to perform relating to material science for sure uh, that's like a very important part uh, to have the pre-processing to make sure that uh, yeah uh, and this is you want to learn representations but you also want to start from a good place that incorporates the somehow the uh, your knowledge this knowledge can be incorporated in the input or in the actual architecture of of the network yeah so that's the answer to your question max just, just type uh, full up question if they if I'm not answering uh, your questions. Hello, I have a question about the comparison yeah. between uh, um, these neural networks with uh, kernel regression or some yeah. kernel kernelized methods like uh, supervisor machines. So, why it makes sense to use one or the other, or why it's more convenient mm -hmm. than yeah. than kernel regression in certain situations? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can comment yeah. on that. Yes. So, uh, so I would say that um, so in neural networks you have different type of uh, so it, most so one question is it depends on your input for example let's say of course if you have uh, images and tasks where there are specific architecture for neural networks that are proven successful and will show the convolution neural network in the next. Uh, Lecture that for sure. I mean, very likely you want to go for that because they 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 show to have a better uh, you know, to perform better because they learn now the deep learning learns automatically the features. So uh, regarding the like the comparison with other methods, I guess it's also a matter of uh, how 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 many samples you have. I guess that's also one one thing to consider because 
if you have a very complex network, you need enough samples, and that really depends. And you can test on generalization ability of your network. And so, uh, so the number of samples is uh, definitely uh, something important to think about. And uh, so then you mentioned about, yes, yeah, for example, uh, if you have uh, more, let's say you have more features than, uh, than samples, right? So then you cannot, you should not use a neural network. That's for sure, you know, it's going to fail. And that's, for example, maybe you can use FCM because they are very good for that because they are uh, using the, the learning only the support vector. So, so that could be an example where you want to use uh, 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 already known, uh, like, like what you mentioned, kind of regression or, I mean, not SVM. Kind of this regression, for example, I think it, I see it as a uh, interpolation method so that you already give a lot of uh, input in what you have, uh, right? The, the right uh, uh, answer, and then you, you you can see it as interpolation across that so that you can give an advantage to a very, very limited uh, uh, sample. So that, that could be one way of looking at that. Okay, thank you.